I want to talk foreign policy with you, but before I do, uh, let's just deal briefly with some big domestic political developments this week. You have the Senate introducing a bipartisan infrastructure bill after months of intense negotiating. And as of today, things have come to a halt, kind of, because Senator Pat Toomey of the Republican Party has put a hold on all amendments. It kind of feels like two steps forward, one step back, or whatever the phrase is, with this infrastructure process. Is it going to pass? It will pass. Um, that's my prediction as we're speaking today. Uh, listen, this is a muscle that the United States Senate has not used in years, uh, passing big, complicated, and important bipartisan pieces of legislation. So it's going to take us a little while to get to the finish line, but we'll get to the finish line because in, in the end there are uh, more than 10 Republicans who will vote to end debate uh, and move to a, a final consideration of uh, a $500 billion infrastructure bill that will be the big biggest bipartisan investment in concrete infrastructure in the history of this country. It doesn't solve all of our problems, but it's been a priority of President Biden's to show that Republicans and Democrats can still work on big things together, and it will um, you know, create a lot of short-term jobs and free up a lot of long-term economic development by cutting down on our commutes in the Northeast, upgrading our energy infrastructure so that we can put more renewables on the grid, um, more electric vehicle charging stations so we can sell more electric vehicles made in the United States. All good news. Uh, and I think by okay. the end of the week or by beginning next week, it'll pass. And separate from the infrastructure bill is the other outstanding matter of passing voting rights legislation, which your colleague Georgia Senator Raphael Warnock has called the infrastructure of our democracy. We may see a new revised bill this week, but it still won't be able to get past the filibuster, the 60 vote requirement. Your colleague Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia said on CNN on Sunday, he will not support a carve out to the filibuster even for this one crucial voting rights bill because he thinks a carve out was abused for judicial nominations in the past. Have a listen to what he said. That carve out worked to really carve us up pretty bad. Yeah. Then you got the Supreme Court. Okay, so there's no stopping it. The whole, the, the, the brilliancy of our, of our founding fathers was this. Why in the world did they give two senators to Rhode Island and Delaware at the time they were forming this great nation of ours when they told New York and Pennsylvania and Ohio, hey, you only get two, too. Mm. It was basically to make us work together. Senator Murphy, the Founding Fathers supported majority rule in the Senate. They didn't have anything to do with the filibuster, which came much later. Why can't you and your Democratic colleagues sit down with Joe Manchin and explain this to him? Why can't you get through to him when he keeps saying awful ahistorical stuff like this again and again? Our democracy's on the line. Well, if Senator Manchin can speak for himself, he's probably not alone in our caucus in having reservations about changing the filibuster. I, I can only speak for myself, Maddie. Um, and what I know is that the Founding Fathers did actually spend a lot of time thinking about the issue of supermajorities. They actually added supermajorities to the document. They said if you want to impeach a president, you want to ratify a treaty, you have to get more than 50% of the Senate. They specifically did not include a supermajority for legislation because they thought they had set up a system that was hard enough to get bills passed through two houses of Congress signed by a president with veto power. So um, your question is, why haven't we been able to convince every Senate Democrat to change the rules? Um, I, I don't know. We will continue to try to press the case and continue to try to make the case that our democracy may fall apart um, if we can't pass uh, supports for voting rights and democracy soon. And on the subject of democracy, last week we watched the first hearings in the House Select Committee uh, to investigate January 6th, and you tweeted something that I think a lot of us have been thinking. Uh, you wrote, a few months ago, my workplace was ransacked by a violent mob that wanted to kill us. People died. Now a bunch of my co-workers are acting like it didn't happen, which is weird and makes me wonder whether they might have been in on it. Am I paranoid? I mean... A lot of people think the Republicans were complicit in it in some way or another. Put aside the kind of, you know, jokey, snarky nature of the tweet. Do you believe that to be the case? Of course. Of course they were in on it. That's why they don't want to do a full investigation, because it, it was their buildup um, to this mob that put us all in jeopardy, that, that almost collapsed our democracy. Remember, those protesters, those rioters were, you know, within a couple seconds of being able to literally grab the electoral ballots from the United States Senate and abscond with them. It, it was the impression that they created that these rioters could stop the inauguration of Joe Biden on that particular day. 
day that put the health of our democracy and the health of the United States Senate in jeopardy. So they don't want to get to the bottom of this because they know it'll be um, their inflammatory rhetoric leading up to January 6th that will, of course, be okay. part of the story. Yes, it will. Uh, let's move to Afghanistan. On Friday, the first round of Afghan nationals, more than 200 interpreters, drivers, and others who helped the U.S. military arrive near Washington for resettlement. The White House is expanding the pool of eligible Afghans who can apply for the special visa program, the special immigrant visa, SIV. But as General David Petraeus has pointed out, it takes longer to get an SIV than for us to put a rover on Mars. Why is it, Senator, that we can invade and occupy a country for two decades, but suddenly we're defeated by internal bureaucracy when we need to help our Afghan allies resettle here. Well, and, and by the way, why didn't we fix this long ago? I mean, we act as if, like, this is the first time that uh, interpreters and others that have helped U.S. forces uh, have their lives put in jeopardy. This has been an ongoing crisis uh, for the almost the entirety of the time we've been in Afghanistan. The Taliban controls um, right now maybe 75 percent of the country, but before Biden's announcement, they controlled 60 percent of the country. So, you know, we need a massive rewrite of our immigration laws. We need to make it much easier for yeah. Anyone who is fleeing violence or persecution to be able to come to the United States. And, Senator, part of this conversation about getting Afghans out of their ASAP is because we've seen a rise in Taliban linked attacks in recent weeks. Right now, there's especially a rise in attacks against the minority Hazara community who have faced historic persecution in Afghanistan for being Shias. Senator, you and I agree that it's time to pull out of Afghanistan, but we have to face the reality, don't we, that the exit comes with a human cost. And I wonder, is there a way of preventing Taliban massacres of minorities without staying put in Afghanistan? for another 20 years. Well, we should continue to be partners with the Afghan government. We should continue to support them diplomatically and economically. We can even offer advice and assistance on security matters. We just can't do the fighting for them any longer. And we also shouldn't forget um, that the last 20 years of U.S. occupation um, has been brutal for Afghans. What's happening now is um, absolutely horrific to watch, but there have been massacres all throughout the U.S. occupation, and we have arguably just um, exacerbated the crisis by lengthening the time that it took for there to be a settlement between the Afghan government and the Taliban. Um, I would argue that the same thing happened in Syria, that uh, Assad was going to win that war, and the United States' participation in it um, just lengthened the time that the civil war took. So we also shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't forget um, the cost that our occupation has um, borne to Afghan citizens over the course of the last 20 years. Moving to the Middle East, yesterday the Israeli Supreme Court asked Palestinian families in East Jerusalem's Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood, the site of much protest and violence this year, to recognize Israeli ownership of their homes, pay a symbolic annual rent. East Jerusalem is occupied territory under international law. So is the West Bank, where the Israeli government went crazy because Ben and Jerry stopped selling ice cream in illegal settlements there. At what point do you and your colleagues in the United States Congress acknowledge that the Israeli government effectively considers all of those occupied territories as part of Israel, which would make it an apartheid state, by the way. Yeah, I, listen, we've got to act with um, deliberate speed uh, to make sure uh, that there is still some viable pathway to a Palestinian state that can exist and be economically competitive. Um, that can happen if these settlements continue, if these evictions continue. I, I am not an expert on Israeli uh, Palestinian property law, uh, but what I know is that the security of a Jewish state in the Middle East is dependent on a future Palestinian state, and that decision as to whether there will be a pathway to a viable Palestinian state is going to be decided in the coming months, uh, perhaps the coming year or two, and so the Biden administration and Congress needs to be very strong. Egypt is another ally of ours in the region. Last week you called for the holding back of our aid to Egypt and said this on the Senate floor. An administration that wants to lead on democracy and human rights cannot send another $1.3 billion to Egypt with no strings attached. To do so would be to endorse Sisi's crackdown and send a bright, blinking message to the world that America talks a big game on democracy 
but isn't willing to do much about it. A lot of Democrats, Senator, were very critical of Donald Trump for kowtowing to foreign dictators. But Joe Biden is pals with CC2. The reality is that whether a Democrat or a Republican is in the White House, U.S. foreign policy often tends to end up being pro-dictator in a lot of places. CC has uh, somewhere around 60,000 political prisoners right now in Egypt. That is a stunning number. Um, as brutal a dictator as Vladimir Putin is, the estimates are he has about 400 political prisoners. And yet we're still in business with CC when he is torturing um, these prisoners who shouldn't be locked up in the first place. Uh, I just think this is an easy call. The statute requires the president to hold back a portion of Egypt's security aid if they haven't made progress on human rights. Not only have they not made progress, they've moved backwards. Just a month after Biden was sworn in, they started targeting yes. uh, the relatives of an American citizen who has been critical of the regime. So, you know, I just don't think we can be credible internationally on the issue of human rights if we aren't able, if we aren't able and willing occasionally uh, to set an example. And this is an opportunity to do it. We don't have to end our security yes. relationship with Egypt. Just hold back some of the money. Just before we run out of time, you and two other senators, Democrat Bernie Sanders, well, independent Bernie Sanders and Republican Mike Lee of Utah introduced a pretty major bill today called the National Security Powers Act that would, as you put it, reclaim Congress's critical role in national security matters. Essentially, the president would have to get Congress's approval in the case of military force, emergency powers, arms exports. And I wonder, it's, it sounds like a great bill to me. I just wonder, a liberal, a democratic socialist and a libertarian came together on this? How did that happen? Yeah, it's a strange coalition, but we all believe um, that the American people should have a say in whether we go to war or whether we sell arms. Um, you know, the foreign policy consensus here in Washington loves foreign interventions. They love selling arms because they make money off of it. Um, the American public are much more hesitant because it's their sons and daughters that end up getting sent overseas to fight these wars. So Sanders, Lee, and I, um, we put together a bill um, that just puts a lot more power back in Congress. It says if there's not an authorization to fight a war overseas, the money gets automatically cut off. Um, that's very different than today where presidents can perpetuate wars overseas and it's up to Congress to pass legislation, which the president then has to sign to stop that funding from going forward. I think this bill just puts a lot more power back in the hands of the people on matters of national security. I think that's what our founding fathers um, designed. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.